Welcome everyone to the new Fly Fisher. I'm your host Bill Spicer. On today's show we join Ontario top guide John Falk and we're going to be floating the Grand River, one of Ontario's largest rivers. Now John not only is a top guide, he's one of the best instructors in the business and I really look forward to learning from him. It's going to be a great show so stay with us, we'll be right back. That was awesome. Let them go back to live another day. Good job. Oh, baby. Look at that fish. That is just so in on. We talked earlier about having the optimum conditions. Here we've got perfect conditions. This is a, a good example of the family Captagenae. This is why you need a lot of backing. On today's show, the new fly fisher crew is fishing one of the largest rivers in the province of Ontario, the Mighty Grand. The Grand River's headwaters start in south central Ontario, just below Georgian Bay, and runs south for 290 kilometers or approximately 175 miles to empty into Lake Erie. Her waters travel through peaceful meadows, deep gorges, and picturesque towns. The river is home to a diverse number of fish species such as rainbow and brown trout in her upper reaches and in her lower reaches there is pike, largemouth and smallmouth bass, catfish and numerous others. Joining me today is John Falk. John is not only an incredible and knowledgeable guide but he's also one of the best fly fishing and fly casting teachers I have encountered in my travels. Also along is Rob Heal, a professional guide and a fun guy to wet a line with. What we're doing, we're just casting across and John told me to put an upstream mend in. And what that means is I'm moving my line upstream and letting it swing. Right at the end, over here, that's where I took it. Doesn't feel too big, but uh, it's a start. We've only been here five minutes, so this is this is good. And it looks like I've got that's a little smallmouth. A little smallmouth, small yeah. Right at the end of the. Did you take it on the swing, or where you, you just took it on the everything? swing? Right, right at the end of the swing. Beautiful. Okay. A little early for bass yet, but a little early, yeah. Beautiful little fish, though, nonetheless. For sure. Now, what I'm going to do today. We're running in, it's pretty warm today. I'm gonna to let John handle all the fish. He, uh, he's expert at this. He can get, release them real quick without uh, harming the fish at all. There we go. There we go. Wow, that's a hot little fly there. A little leech pattern. Then it's, it's just a leech, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a little white leech. There's a, there are many different types of structure that hold fish. You can come to a very nondescript part of the river and think that it's actually void of fish because basically you see nothing. But it doesn't take much. A little boulder the size of a big potato will hold a fish behind it. it the, the requirement by a fish is just something to break the current so that they can pull in behind there so they don't have to expel as much energy. So a structure can be anything from the size of your fist to a nice rock would be the size of your head. And then the large boulders, those are extremely high potential places. That's the stuff you want to look for. Sunken logs work really well. And the, the one point of structure that not a lot of people look at, and we talked about it earlier, are the actual current seams themselves. If you get a definite current seam where you have a fast water edge and a slow water to the right or to the left of that, they'll lie in that slow water, move into the fast water to feed you always want to look for those structure points. Nice cast. Now if you look slightly downstream, Bill, you'll see those big boulders up against the bank. Yeah, and then a swirling current off of the boulders, there's another big rock in the water, you know, directly out in front of them. 
10 feet in front of them. Yeah. The swirls there, yeah. Yeah, you can see those swirls. Yeah. Good little spot right in there. Nice little pocket. It's close to shade. A nice little piece of uh, deeper water. That's the spot. I think you found it, Bill. Yeah. And the year prior to that was 24 and a quarter inches, which was seven pounds. And they're getting bigger. <laughs> Did you want a three weight or a two weight, Bill? Pardon me? You want a three weight or a two weight for these for these no, little bass? No, these this is fine. I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine. kidding, buddy. I know you're just kidding. Because that's the time you put that on and get that nice big steelhead. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Which by the way, we did see a steelhead a little farther up. And John estimates it at five to six pounds, so you gotta match your, your equipment to the fish. There you go, sir. Thank you. We start out using a streamer in a searching method. This setup is using a floating line attached to a sinking leader to a short monofilament leader with a streamer. The second setup is a nymph setup using a strike indicator with a 9 foot leader tapered to a 4x tippet with split shot 14 to 16 inches from the fly. The third is a dry fly setup using a floating line with a tapered leader to 4x tippet and a fly of choice. Got one. Not big, Excellent. but I got one. Excellent. Yeah. Right where you said, Rob. Good. Exactly where you said. He's not huge, but he's a trout. Well, it's certainly nice to see uh, a variety of sizes too. It gives you yes. This good this is good. This, this tells a... us we got a healthy industry here. Right there. Now he's so nice small. Job. I'm just gonna try to turn the hook upside down and let him go. There he goes. Well, the technique works. You just gotta be persistent at it. Little ones become big ones eventually. Great. Try that again. No five weight. No, I don't think so. <laughs> but I did mention five weight a couple of other times, so. The, uh, the rods of choice that uh, Bill brought along with him today, he's using this five weight Winston, which is a medium to soft action rod, which is a great, great dry fly rod. Um, in the softer actions of rod, you can actually see the flex of the tip of the rod. Let me just bring it in here for you. You can see the flex of the tip of that rod. That soft action, especially when we're fishing a dry fly, gives the shock absorbency that you need when you hook especially a large rainbow and it jumps and carries on. You get that bend and flex in the rod tip. So when you're fighting a bigger fish, a little bit softer tip rod is always a real bonus for you. Fast action rods are great casting tools, but not that great for fish fighting. So a softer rod is definitely uh, one of my rods of choice as well. And Bill brought along this five weight Winston. This is in a nine foot five weight. Um, nice rod, you know, nine foot is a great um, all-purpose type rod, but you could also get up to a nine and a half foot or even a 10 foot rod. As, as you go longer in lengths, in rod lengths, mending becomes easier and fly casting and presentation become a little bit easier. So it's just something to keep in mind. So that's the five weight that Bill, Bill has been using mainly the best part of the day. We've also been using this for the streamers. There's a little white streamer we were talking about earlier. We've also been using this as four streamers, and you've seen Bill set hook or hook set on a number of good fish and fight them on that rod. It's got a really nice bend to it, so it's a, a good rod of choice when you're fishing trout. The other rod that Bill brought along is the Loomis Cross Current. This is a nine foot seven weight, and I asked Bill to bring this along just in case we found a pool with some dropback steelhead. And you know, as we progress into the evening hours, that might that possibility just might be getting even better yet. Uh, we have seen steelhead coming up rising in the past for some of the, uh, the hatches that are coming off the river. The, the abundance of insects is actually bringing those steelhead up. So if we get an opportunity to see that some of those larger fish, we're definitely going to string this rod up and, uh, and get it to use. Now 
Rob, you brought me to this certain stretch of water here, and you figure we're going to take fish here. Can you describe for the audience why you brought me here and why you figure the fish are here? Well, as you were just saying, one of the nice things about the drift boat is we are able to use it as transportation from one run to the next. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, we've taken fish in here before on a yeah. fairly regular basis, but that notwithstanding, if you look at, at this run, what we have above us here is a real shallow riffle, yeah. and then it dumps into this long pool that's off over your right shoulder, yeah. or sorry, this long run. Now, there's very definite current seams in here, yes. and the fish will generally hold on these seams, any converging currents, and you can see there's, if you look at the bubble lines going down here, there's definite current seams, that's where the feed is gonna go, and the fish will stack up on those, on those lies. So what we should do is start in real close, because there's there'll probably be fish holding within 15 or 20 feet of us, yeah. and then we'll gradually work our way out with a kind of a foot after each cast, and just cover the water that we can in front of us, then take a couple of steps down, repeat that process until we've fished the entire so run. So start in close, make your way across, come back, and then go down, make your way across. That's right. My approach is I'll, I'll cast until I can no longer manage the length of line that I have yeah. out. Then I'll put the line back on my reel, take a few steps down, and repeat that process. And what you're doing is you're covering water moving away from you in a ray like that, mm -hmm. and each cast you're covering different lanes. Okay. Okay? It's a fairly nondescript run, so there's not a lot of definition that we can see. We can't see any large boulders or structure that the fish could be hiding, right. <clears throat> pardon me, hiding behind. Um, so just covering every inch of water is it just makes sense. It's probably the, uh, the, the best approach to a okay. run like this. Yeah, well, let's give it a shot. All right. Now, Rob, you were just working the seam out here? Yeah, just at the... Uh, the head of the seam? At the, at, the, at the bottom end. Put that little pink worm on. Well, that's a beautiful rainbow. That's, look at that. That's a really nice fish. We won't even Pop net him. That. There, that pops out of there. That's a beautiful, beautiful rainbow. Good, Good job, buddy. Thanks, man. So you work this run out here. Good job. So you work this run out here. We just thought we'd stop here and nymph this pool for a little bit. You came right up into the head of the pool. You can see the definite seam right in here. Yeah, and, and that's you, what I was looking at, where the where this riffle kind of dumps into this this long run. Uh, it's you got a, a fairly dramatic drop in the uh, in the the river bottom where it where it deepens, and it just looked like a likely uh, likely looking spot. Good stuff. Little indicator and a Sam Juan worm. Yeah, well, sometimes that's all it takes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So much for matching the hatch. That's right. Yeah. No, I just thought I'd go with something different because there's so much there's so much um, uh, bug life in this river that um, I've often found in here that uh, it, it's just going with something that's dramatically different, just to set it apart from the. Uh, from the rest of what the fish are uh, so used to seeing, and uh, oh, paid off. Yeah, just getting away from the norm. Yep. All right, buddy. Well, good job, man. All right. Let's okay. Let's get, get Bill into a fish. Yeah. He really needs one bad. When we started off first thing this morning, I put on a uh, a light little streamer for Bill. That's the little pattern right here. And we've just recently named this the, uh, the Crawford Smolt because it actually does represent a, a small smolt of some kind swimming in the water. Joe Penich, one of the fly tires from the shop, has been a very successful streamer and, and steelhead fisherman for many years and has come up with a series of bait fish patterns. And this small little fry, which he calls the Niagara River Fry, has been a fantastic pattern. We're actually going to use this a little bit farther on down some of the deeper pools as we uh, cover some of the other trout water through the course of the day. And then the old classic woolly bugger. You can see the woolly bugger is a fantastic fly. When I uh, started Bill on nymphing, we went into the Prince Nymph, which is a small nymph with the two small white by wings, as you can see right here. And the Prince Nymph has always been a very effective fly for us in this river. It's more of an attractor type pattern, but there are fly patterns or nymph patterns in the water that do have the very, very significant or distinct white stripe down the back like an Isonychia nymph. The formation of the nymph itself 
is the peacock curl body with the white bite wings and a small bead head. And we go into the next level where we get into like a small pheasant tail nymph with a bead head or without a bead head. It gives us more weight with the bead head obviously to get down a little deeper. And without the bead, don't forget when you're fishing a nymph, the, the nymph pattern will actually float freer in the water without the bead head. It doesn't have the weight to take it down. As we progress through the evening, we're going to start to see caddis flies coming off the water. The adult caddis, a deer hair pattern like this, we'll see bouncing around on the surface. And when the fish start coming up for the caddis, you'll see the first splashy rises. Those are definitely an emerger rise. The emergers are this little CDC wing pattern. You can see the gray CDC. And that represents an emerger just in the film, in the surface film itself. In other words, as the pattern, as the nymph starts to pupate, it comes to the surface, it lies in the film, and that's where they're, they are most susceptible to be taken or eaten by trout. So these are the CDC patterns. And then we'll progress farther into the evening and we'll start to see some spinners on the water. The spinners are the clear wing, or in this situation here, we have a variant with a light hackled wing and they're trimmed down so that they lay flat on the surface film. Okay, Bill, we should probably head down, wouldn't we? Okay. Definitely an emerger rice and a caddis emerger. <laughs> I misjudged it there. What I'm doing, Bill, is um, I'm, I'm referring to the rice forms out here and, and what I'm seeing is they're not a big splashy rise. A big splashy rise will indicate that a fish has come up, taken an emerger, right. or a fly that's pupating, right? Well, these fish, we looked at it, there's a few duns coming off the water. Generally, you'll get a big slurp out of a dun rise. These are soft takes. So what they're doing, and we're seeing the odd spinner on the water now, and I'm gonna tie on this little spinner right here. Little rusty colored spinner. And those soft takes that we're seeing, and those are big fish. Yeah are spinner rises. Look at that rise oh, form right there. Yeah, that's, a, that's a big slurp. So they're taking spinners, but they're a nice soft rise. A spinner can't move. It's not going away from the fish. They're not in a hurry to take it. Yeah, they know that, that yeah, it's, it's not going nowhere. The food source is there. Another one right there again. Wow. The food source is there. It's easy for them to feed on. So therefore, it's a nice, easy rise for them. So that's why I'm saying, let's change up. There he is again. Wow. Got him. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, John, did you ever call that one? Yes, excellent. Now, that did the trick. We, we changed to a spinner. And John, just by his experience, has decided, you know, that was a spinner rise. He could tell easily what it was. Now, this feels like a bass. No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, this ain't no bass. It's not going to allow me to get him on the reel, so let's see if we can get him up. Yes, yes. It's One great. thing about any kind of dry fly or spinner, you That's must a nice rainbow, yeah, you must allow the fish to take the fly down first before you set your hook. This is a good fish. That is a good fish. This is a good fish. Now what I meant by that, he come up, he grabbed the fly first, then went down. That's when I lifted my rod. If you get too uh, too anxious, you're gonna break him off. Nice rainbow. Good one. Oh, and he let go. Oh, That's okay. Oh, oh, oh. That's what he took the fly, actually. That's 4X tippet, Bill. <laughs> no, that, <laughs> don't That's be okay. Don't be afraid to let them run. Yep. That, no, the, he uh, busted the, the actual not busted. Oh. oh, what can I say? But that was a great fish. John called it. The fish come up nicely, took the fly down. I lifted up. But John called it right there as a spinner. Boy, boy, oh boy. This is great. Would you ever believe that you had this kind of fishing this close to home, Bill? Well, we're, we're pretty lucky here in Ontario. Uh, we have a number of streams around here that, that do have this kind of fishing. Uh, I, I live very close to here, so this is great for me. Uh, but uh, I, I really didn't realize that this part of the part of the Grand River fish so well. Uh, the Grand River fish is well end to end, but, but this particular part, it's wonderful. Huh? Dry fly fishing like this, big fish coming up, it's great. Just great. Determining what fly to use on any particular day is as easy as observing what insects are caught in spider webs or trees. There is no need to know what the Latin name of the insect is, simply knowing it's a mayfly or a caddisfly is enough. When matching what you see, copy the size and okay. color of the insect. Throw a little mint on it. There we go. Throw a little 
Ana. Kid, just catching dinks, or what are you doing? Looks like a good fish, eh, Robbie? Oh, almost double header. This is the fly that Rob was using across the river, and uh, it's turned out to be the hot fly. It's a, a little yellow uh, wet fly, soft hackle wet fly, and he's swinging it in the current just under the surface. Seems to be the one. Just got a hit. Ooh, hit it again. This is uh, like a do nothing method. All we're doing is we're casting out to about the middle of the stream, a little downstream, put a little mend up, and then follow along with the rod tip. I'm keeping the rod tip fairly high. You'll know right away as soon as something touches the fly. So a do nothing technique here, but Robbie's just killing them over there. Like there, right there. Oh yeah. Good yeah. Job, Bill. That that was on cue. Yeah. Cast it and leave it. It's a, it's a do nothing type of technique. Very effective. John was just saying, not many people that he hears of uses wet flies anymore. And there we go. Come here, you. And there we go. Now let's try that again. Like I say, it's a do nothing technique, and you know right away when you get a hit because it's boom, and the fish is pretty much sets its own hook. You, all you have to do is lift up the rod a bit. Not very hard either. Try that again. Well, it's about time to go. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I've certainly enjoyed the instruction I got from John. Give him a call if you want a great day out on the river. For more information on today's show and other shows we have, visit us on the World Wide Web at www.thenewflyfisher.com. From all of us here at The New Fly Fisher, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.